Good afternoon, everyone. I was a bit uh, worried when I saw my big picture on the poster out there that you were going to expect me to tap dance or something. But my role today is actually to chair a wonderful panel. And I'd like to invite our panelists, Ed Stelmach, uh, Janet Fast, uh, Jim Hole, and uh, Bill Schottick to come up to, to the stage while I say a few words because I don't want to uh, <clears throat> take up a lot of time. I do think Ailes is where it's at. I think all of us would say that our lives are affected by all of the issues that this faculty deals with. And if we look back to the early days, I think when Ailes was formed, the, world, the world's population was maybe between a quarter and a third of what it is now. So many issues have developed. When I was a little girl, we were worried about the baby boomers hitting the schools. Now we're worried about the baby boomers as the older generation. And all of the issues that are being dealt with here really are a challenge uh, for, for public policymakers as well. And I was interested when uh, Minister Vernon Olson talked about being a lawyer in the agriculture uh, portfolio, but it's very important because many of the issues that we're faced deal with dealing with international regulations, uh, how we legally organize things, but it reminded me of a story the number of years ago when in the United States, uh, a newly elected member of the House of Representatives from Manhattan was appointed to the House Agricultural Committee and he said I'm not quite sure why I was appointed that committee the only crop in my riding is marijuana so uh, but the point is that Ailes is where it's at and it is in terms for policymakers for all of us as citizens as consumers uh, you know it's funny 20 years ago uh, if somebody had said to me you know Edmonton's a leader in composting I would have thought oh who knew the other day, somebody said that they were working for Waste Management Edmonton, and Edmonton was a leader on composting, and I hastened to assure her that I have a compost bu bucket uh, in my house that I use, because all of these issues go to the fundamental basis of our quality of life, and we need the research, we need the leadership in public policy. So today's panel is extraordinary. They are people who represent a variety of these issues, so I hope that they will stimulate uh, your thinking, uh, perhaps give you some information you didn't know, and help us to set the stage for the next hundred years of ales because uh, I, I meant it when I said to the Dean that this is where it's at and the issues that are preoccupying this faculty will continue to be at the heart of our quality of life and our survival actually uh, as a species on the planet and the next hundred years are going to be crucial. So now I'm going to come and uh, uh, allow you to hear from our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, yesterday I had a great uh, conversation with all of our panelists, and they all have many interesting things to say. I'm going to start with Ed Stelmach, uh, who, uh, in addition to being obviously former Premier of Alberta, also served in the Agriculture, Food, and Rural Development portfolio, and then also as Minister of Transport. And we were talking yesterday about some of the issues that you thought were really crucial in terms of uh, that you that you have seen about where the issues related to, to agriculture and the future of the, of the province hit. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? That was most interesting. Sure. And once again, thank you for the invitation, allowing uh, uh, me to participate uh, this afternoon. In many of the travels, uh, whether as Minister of Agriculture or as Premier to many countries, I found that uh, we're always behind in getting our agricultural products to market even though we're very proud of the biosecurity, the food security. And uh, I remember the one time we were in the United Emirates and we're eating Idaho potatoes. And it got me so upset that I couldn't eat the potatoes, but <laughs> <coughs> it's just why were Idaho potatoes there and not Alberta potatoes? So once again, uh, I, in discussing uh, the next 100 years, the faculty will be doing a lot of work in terms of market access. And how do we avoid a lot of the foreign government policies that restrict food uh, exports to all the countries around the world? There are some steps being taken today, but sometimes when you do get the access, we can't get our products to port. And as you know, lately we've been battling uh, for access because of the volume of oil that's traveling to our, to our ports. And uh, this, again, is going to not only impact agriculture, but forestry in the future. Do you think it's because people maybe just don't know the value of, of these products? Because I would assume that they're probably pretty significant economically. They're, in, in traveling um, to many of the countries, uh, certainly many know about Alberta because of our resources, but certainly not as much about our agricultural products. And I think 
for us to be successful, and again, uh, there's another f former uh, Minister of Agriculture, Shirley McClellan, in, in the audience. We also talked to someone that is well known to all of us here, and that's Kim McConnell. And we share one idea that we want to put forward, and that is when we talk about the ag food industry, we have a hyphen between ag and food. So primary production and value added. And we have to remove that hyphen because we're all in it together. And sometimes the primary producer is doing well, the value added is suffering, and vice versa. And we see those shifts constantly. And I, I, we've just got to deal with the transportation issue, number one. And the other is uh, we will not be able to add more value to our primary products unless we deal with, uh, and as the Dean said, uh, our labor availability. 138,000 new people moved to Alberta last year, and we're still struggling to fill many of the positions uh, in the value-added industry. So I, I think that's one of the major issues facing us. There is the issue of land base, which is uh, touched, and I'll, I'll share this. I, you know, when I was Premier, we were traveling to Beaumont uh, one early morning, uh, and uh, just watching construction firm widen 50th Street, and I look where they're placing the culvert, and honestly, like six feet of black soil, and we're going to cover it up in concrete. And, you know, it, it, it hurts because, uh, you know, when our, our <clears throat> when my grandparents came here in 1898 in search of good soil that they could own. And uh, there's something about, as you know, Jim, putting your hands in that black soil and just the, 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 the odor, you know, the, the scent. And uh, so we've got to deal with it, and, and I'm glad that the municipality is starting to work together. Well, you know, it's interesting, because moving on, moving on to Jim, who is a graduate uh, from uh, the University of Alberta with a BSc in Agriculture, and many of us know him from uh, the Enjoy Center that he created, and just last week we had a wonderful event there for the University, the President Society Dinner, and I was so glad to be able to be there and see it, because people had talked about it, and it's an extraordinary center. And I want to, to, to uh, draw you out a little bit on the, uh, the notion of... Uh, of entrepreneurship and what some of the young graduates from Ailes maybe can learn about how to translate what they're doing into business, because many of them won't want to do that. But just picking up about what Ed Stomach said about the soil, because you, you are yourself uh, a, a, a cultivator and farmer, a lot of people don't realize that soil is not something easy to make. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, we think of dirt. Every kid gets covered dirt, but there's a difference between dirt and soil. And I'm going to go back to Bill Shadig at the end too. And I think this is something that maybe uh, this is something that our Ailes faculty can, uh, can help to make more understood by the public. Well, well I, can, I can sell you products in the Enjoy Center to make a garden better, if that's what you need. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and I know Jim Robertson's out there, former uh, professor of soil science, and I think I used the term dirt once and he kind of took me to task on that. Uh, yeah, it's critical. I mean, the thing is the soil is absolutely a fundamental uh, aspect of growing here in Alberta. Of course, we have great soils. We're in that black soil mm -hmm. zone, which isn't, uh, black soils aren't that common. Mm -hmm. Uh, high quality soils uh, throughout uh, the world, so we're fortunate to have that. Um, yeah, on the Enjoy, we chatted a bit yesterday about the Enjoy Center and the, the challenges with that and uh, how, you, you know, how you get something that massive going. And I would say anybody who's looking at getting into business, uh, the one lesson that I think I really learned in this past few years is to ensure that you engage with everybody involved in the process. So I think that's a mistake that I think that I made early on is not ensuring that everybody knows what you're trying to achieve. It sounds fairly pretty basic, but that, that goes right from the, uh, your employees to the, to, your, to the bankers, to you name it, uh, the people involved in the construction. And so if you get everybody involved early, take a bit longer to really shape the vision then you're going to have something at the end that you're very proud of. But if you don't really establish that from the get-go, then you're off on the wrong foot. What are the things from your, uh, your education here at U of A that you find you apply most to your business? Uh, the things that you learn that you think are the most useful lessons? Well, I think there's a technical side of the education. That's critical. You have to have that. But I think it's uh, developing those relationships. Actually, I go back to Ag 4204. Anybody remember that? Fred Bentley. Um, Dr. Fred Bentley talked about how critical it is to be able to communicate properly, mm. how, how, how important it is to get your message out. 
uh, to wherever you end up in your career in agriculture or beyond. So that was something. We sort of don't enough. think of agricultural people, or Aggies, as being great communicators. We somehow think of the, the sort of the stoic, stalwart farmer, you know, the standing with his hoe. But well, and I think you're you've got to be, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be, I think, a reasonably good communicator. Mm -hmm. You've got to communicate the message to, again, all the people that are important in the success of your business. Yeah. And so that's something that, that uh, Dr. Bentley instilled. He did have those cards, though. And if you ever said, um, you were in trouble. And so you had to really ensure that you were very clear in your message. You didn't stumble very much. I, I didn't do very well in that first class, but I learned over time. You know, Jim, uh, it, it's impossible to have you on the panel without ref referencing the fact that your family have been, had an extraordinary relationship with the University of Alberta and have been, have been great leaders there. And we were talking yesterday about your, your dad, who was very active in the U of A Alumni Association. And, uh, and his relationship with the university, I thought it was a really interesting observation you had about how he, f he felt about U of A even long after he was out of the university. Right, so dad, dad his background was, uh, he's from the city. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were nine kids in his family and um, five brothers, five engineers. Uh, he decided that agriculture was his, uh, the way to go in life. He wanted to be entrepreneurial and he wanted to, uh, to farm. He decided that's the way that he saw the future with his family. And his relationship with the U of A was a very strong one where he felt that he did get the technical skills required to do the job, but he felt he could always go back to the U of A and uh, talk to his colleagues and his professors and get some help if he needed it because he did not have that uh, basic feel of the land. Mm -hmm. Ed grew up on the farm, Ed knows that. Dad didn't have that instinct. So he had to rely on his colleagues and his professors to get, to get uh, I think, through some pretty mm -hmm. tough years. But I would think that probably that continuing relationship would be very important for everybody, even, even the people who grew up on the farms, that the research is changing. I mean, do you feel that the, the university has a, you know, gets the information to you that you need when your uh, new things are being developed? And I think, yeah, and the thing is too, I think that because of that, um, his education at the U of A, he wasn't afraid to try new technologies. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the first people to purchase a precision seeder for the vegetable operation. That was revolutionary at the time. He took a chance on it, uh, and he, he, having talked to the people in the know about uh, the future of agriculture, he decided to purchase a precision seeder, which really got us on the road to growing vegetables and, and then down the road the greenhouse business. I don't even know whether Ailes has a kind of uh, program of continuing education. I'm sure it does, but it seems to me that those relationships are really important in terms of keeping up, up to date, and particularly those of you like you who are the, the entrepreneurs. When I talked to, uh, to Janet Faster today, she said that human ecology, which is the department that she leads, is a bit of an outlier uh, in the department in the sense that it's not involved, involved uh, with some of the, the, the technical issues that are, are done in agriculture and forestry, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about what, you, what human ecology is about? Because it seems to me it's also at the heart of our well-being mm -hmm. in our communities. Well, to put it really simply, um, human ecology is really about understanding people in their various environments, in interaction with their various environments. In human ecology, we tend to focus primarily on the near environment of, uh, of family, of home, of community. Um, so we're, we're really trying to understand um, what enhances the well-being of individuals, of families, of communities. Um, and it, from a, a number of different perspectives in, in terms of economic well-being and, and uh, relationship well-being and um, being able to access appropriate services and so on in the community and the, the quality of the environment in the community and those kinds of things. I was just talking to one of your colleagues who said she'd come back from a, a federal provincial minister's meeting. Your part of the department is consulted often by policymakers. Can you talk a little bit about some of the legislation that people have asked you to provide uh, basic uh, understanding to create? Yeah, we've been doing research on aging in, in my own research group for a number of years. And so we've, we've developed some pretty good relationships with uh, both federal and provincial government organizations. And I, I lead um, typically fairly large, um, large research teams that um, kind of span the, the, um, the breadth of Canada. So we're working with not just Alberta government, but other governments as well. Um, in, in our particular group, we have um, worked with, for example, um, 
now called Employment and Social Development Canada at the federal level related to some of the programs that they administer, like the Compassionate Care Program, um, the Compassionate Care Benefit, um, caregiver tax credits, those kinds of things. We've consulted with them on, on those kinds of issues. Uh, most recently at the federal level, the, the Canadian Human Rights Commission, which is now um, involved in uh, some action around um, some case law that is is making um, the um, the point that families who have care responsibilities need to, those care responsibilities need to be accommodated in the workplace. So there's some new case law um, evolving around that in terms of employers' um, duty to accommodate care responsibilities in the workplace. Here in Alberta, uh, most recently, I was asked to um, consult with um, Matt Genereau, who was putting forward a private member's bill in the Alberta legislature that would um, extend the, pro the job protections offered by the compassionate care leave at the federal level to provincial um, people who are, are working in provincially regulated industries. Um, and so we now have that, that legislation in place. You talked about wanting to uh, challenge a conventional wisdom and you have particularly strong views about how people see the aging population. And as part of that big post-war baby boomer demographic that, that everybody was you know, terrified was gonna hit retirement age, um, is this something that we should really worry about? What, you know, how do you see this? You, you said that, that, that the, I love the expression, the silver tsunami was an expression that you didn't like. <laughs> How should we, we look at this, this demographic shift as this aging, large aging generation is coming through? I think there's no question that there will be challenges that we have to face and to meet. Um, certainly, a lot of the work that we've been doing recently has been around how do we, how do we meet the, the care needs of um, that part of the, the aging population that's going to require care. And that population is going to continue to grow um, not because older people or seniors are unhealthy or less healthy than they used to be. In fact, a lot of them are more healthy than they used to be. Um, but they're just, the numbers are growing. But at the same time, because people are aging um, in a much more healthy way, um, and many older people now are more financially secure as well, um, there's, um, there, older people are also making huge contributions. Um, they've made huge contributions throughout their lives and they continue to make contributions into later life by um, grandparenting, by uh, working as volunteers in the community. More and more people are staying in the labor force longer. Um, the fastest growing age group in the, in the workforce are older workers. Um, so I think there, there needs to be a, a balanced perspective about the, the implications of population aging. Um, there are challenges, but there are also a lot of benefits. I mean, the, the very fact that we have an aging population is a huge accomplishment. Yeah, yeah so those 54-year-old farmers are actually really young pups. <laughs> <laughs> William uh, Shoddick is, is a, a renowned soil and water expert and uh, he came to the University of Alberta in 2011. And he has a very interesting background because he's not, he didn't come from a background where you would expect him to become fascinated with the, or with the soil and water. We, we talk a little bit about how that love affair began in your life because uh, you were a, a nice boy from Toronto. <laughs> And uh, next thing we know, here you are. Yes, yes. And Kim, I was hoping you wouldn't mention that uh, <laughs> here, here in Alberta. But uh, now that you have, uh, yes, so I'm originally uh, from Toronto. And, uh, but I grew up in the west end of Toronto. So specifically. <laughs> He's scrambling, folks. He's scrambling. No, specifically the village of Swansea. I'm very proud of that. So when I was a kid, it was a village. It wasn't part of the city of Toronto. And it's very green. It's 60% uh, tree cover. So I was sur surrounded by parks and ponds and all that. So I grew up with nature right downtown in Toronto. But uh, my father was uh, an immigrant from Ukraine. And as a kid, I heard a lot about farms and how wonderful they are. And at some point, uh, I asked him if he would buy us one, which he did. He just <laughs> went out and bought a farm. And not every dad would he do that. He was so glad you didn't want a car. So. 
I never asked for a car. <laughs> I, uh, I was very specific. And uh, so he bought this little farm, and I just fell in love. I just fell in love. And uh, so the farm has excellent soil. So I must say, when I got the invitation from Stan to join this panel, I was sure he'd made a mistake. And, uh, but now that I realize it's a panel of soil appreciation, okay, I feel right at home. So this farm has wonderful soil. And I just thought it was amazing that you could plant some seeds and you had these amazing crops. And so that's when I decided to study soil science. And, uh, but this little farm also has an artesian spring. And I was fascinated by this artesian spring because it's, the water flows all the time. So that was sort of the beginning of my learning of hydrology. And uh, when I moved to Switzerland and set up my first lab, I used this water from the farm as my reference water. And I've been testing the water for more than 20 years. Uh, the more I test it, the cleaner it becomes. And when we built our ultra clean lab in Heidelberg, and we did 15,000 years of ice for heavy metals, I thought, let's just do the water out of curiosity. Take us about two days. That was 10 years ago. We're still working on it. That's how clean it is. So we've got three dedicated groundwater sampling wells. The water is so clean, we have to filter the air before we sample it. And when we tried to find data for comparison, we couldn't find any data, but I started looking at the data on bottled waters. And that's how we found all of the bottled waters all around the world are all contaminated because of leaching from the plastic. So, um, and bottled waters and glass are contaminated with lead because of leaching from the glass. So this became our gold standard of water, the water that's on that little farm property. And where is this little farm property? Because we <laughs> I'm glad, go with our little drinking straws. I, I'm glad you asked. It's in Elmvale, Ontario. It's a beautiful little farming community in Springwater Township where the water literally gushes out of the ground. And because it's wonderful water, and because we're so lucky to have that water, my question is how do we protect this water for future generations so that they can enjoy it too? I don't want anybody to ever say, this area used to have good water. Okay, so that's why the Elmvale Water Festival and the Elmvale Foundation, which is a federally registered charity for environmental education. And is water of that purity uh, found elsewhere? I mean, do we have sources here around Edmonton that we can all go to and fill up our buckets with? Um, or, is, or is that a unique and rare? Well, uh, now that phenomenon? we've built the beautiful new ultra clean swamp lab, okay, for studying heavy metals and soil water air manure plants in our faculty, beautiful lab. And by the way, thank you to the folks here that made it possible to build that lab and also to the people who run the lab. We are now on the hunt for clean water here in Alberta and I guess we're gonna find some. That's very exciting. I want to ask you about uh, a very important research that you've done that's announced today in the Edmonton Journal. But before I do, you also made a comment, you know, why does a, a guy who's been in Toronto and Switzerland, whatever, come to University of Alberta? Well, it's a great university, but even more so that this faculty has some special resources you were talking about that, uh, that enable people to uh, do research th that maybe they couldn't do elsewhere. Well, what I want to say, it is a wonderful place to be. No question about that. The university has been very, very supportive of everything I want to do here. Our faculty, our former dean, our present dean, the chairman of my department. It's a wonderful group of people. There's a fantastic atmosphere within this faculty. It's very supportive. It's very collegial. And uh, uh, I, I couldn't be happier. So we've, we've really got an amazing setup. And I'm w literally working with colleagues from across the campus. You know, so within the department, within the faculty, but the faculty of medicine and engineering and earth sciences and biology and biochemistry, there's some really awesome people on this campus. No question about it. But you were talking about uh, that you have access to farms and ranches that are part of the university. Well, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Bocock family who are here, uh, we now have uh, the St. Albert Research Station in St. Albert, an 800-acre uh, property. So, you know, not every father is in the position where they can buy a farm for their kid. Okay, but for those of you who don't have your own farm, not to worry. 
University of Alberta has several of them, and they're beautiful properties. So there's the St. Albert Research Station, um, but there's also the Macy's Ranch, for example. And these are tremendous opportunities for people to actually get out there and dig a hole and get their hands dirty. And that's when you begin to understand what soil is and plant roots are and water flow and all that kind of stuff. So um, professors are, are wonderful people and it's lovely to sit there in the class and listen to their lectures and buy their textbooks, okay? But you have to actually go out there and see these things. And the University of Alberta has created these tremendous opportunities for students to, to do that. That's exciting. And one, one, one other thing, because I want to ask you all to make some comments on an issue that's very dear to my heart. But before I do, you have some research that's, being, uh, that's just been, been published yes. that you've done with your Ultra Clean Lab. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, Janet, we were talking about uh, confronting conventional wisdom on things so that we can move to good policy making. And you've uh, just issued some research that has uh, been very interesting for people uh, with respect to the, the oil sector. Sure. So, uh, um, so I've been studying lead in the environment for more than 25 years using a peat bog in Switzerland, using an ice core in the Arctic. We've reconstructed lead in the atmosphere going back in time 15,000 years. So we can see lead pollution beginning in the high Arctic of Canada 3,500 years ago from the lead mines in, in Spain. So I'm very familiar with the entire history of, of lead pollution for 3,500 years. And I was sitting in my office in Heidelberg looking at the Globe and Mail online, the headline, the editorial, lead from the oil sands industry going into the Athabasca River. Well, I didn't see how that could be possible because as far as I knew, bitumen is very well known to be enriched in vanadium and nickel and molybdenum, but I've never heard of lead and bitumen. And same thing with the other so-called calcophile heavy metals, antimony, thallium, silver, and so on. You just don't find them in bitumen. So that really didn't make any sense. And uh, so this has been kind of my mission to find out what's really going on there. And uh, so we collected moss all around the oil sands mining region. And moss is a really cool plant. It has no roots. It just kind of sits there and whatever's in the air, that's how it survives, whether it's nutrients or contaminants. And uh, so we built this beautiful new ultra clean lab. And that's literally our first publication. Okay, so I've been here three years now, our first publication, so I'm certainly not fast. But we did our very, very best to dot the I and cross the T. I've never seen such clean moss, ever. These are the lowest lead concentrations in moss that I've ever seen. And I compared the moss with the same species of moss from peat bogs in southern Germany, measured in our ultra-clean lab in Germany. And the moss from Alberta, much lower concentrations of lead, silver, cadmium, antimony, and thallium, which is exactly what you'd expect if you read some papers about the geochemistry of bitumen. So on the one hand, um, exciting results maybe for some people, but for somebody who has a background in geochemistry, it's exactly what you would expect. Wow, it's gonna be very interesting to see the public reaction. What I didn't say in my, my opening remarks is, of course, the reason why I'm here at the University of Alberta is to help to create the Peter Lawhey Leadership College, which will open in the fall of 2016. And the college will be for third and fourth year students, and one of our great uh, concerns is to make it as diverse as possible in terms of the disciplines that students take because that really adds to the the learning experience and we are very much hoping that we will have AL students and we're recruiting a pioneer class for the fall of 2015 uh, so students who are now in second year would be eligible to apply to that and the things that the Dean talked about in terms of decision making and team building etc are all things that we want to look at but all of you um, our leaders in your own way. And I wanted to just come back with another round of conversation with you about your own views about leadership, because you're all leaders, things that you learn. And, and Ed, you have a reputation of having gotten contentious legislation through the Alberta legislature, even with the support of the opposition. What were some of the lessons that you learned in that experience that you think uh, stand the test of time in terms of leadership? A lot of red wine. Um. <laughs> well. 
<coughs> no, uh, to be honest, I was privileged in the years I served in the Alberta legislature to have uh, very credible uh, opposition critics, uh, people that uh, you could approach and share the bill and discuss the, uh, all the parts of the bill, uh, the purpose of the bill, and you know uh, those that have served in the legislature, either federal or provincial, it's kind of against the tradition to share any legislation with your opposition unless the bill is introduced in the House. But I had uh, critics when I was in agriculture, Dr. Ken Nichol, well known to agriculture and, and universities in, in Alberta, and we'd sit down and we talk about why do we need the legislation? Why, why are we going through the process? And, uh, and then um, we often found that if, if you could give an opportunity for your opposition critic to present an amendment in the House, get the credit for the amendment, and then you'd get the vote on the bill. And the other trick was to make sure it's on the order paper as soon as the legislature opens. Uh, people don't get as <coughs> catty and angry at each other uh, at the beginning. But I tell you, if you sit in that building for six, seven weeks, um, you know, your patience <laughs> wears out quite a bit. So uh, it's been an incredible experience. And I, I remember uh, talking about, uh, you know, some of the, the security or the issues around traceability in beef. When we first introduced the legislation, we ran into a lot of issues. Uh, a considerable opposition from producers, especially smaller producers that, you know, have to, you know, have a good corral system, catch their calves and tag and record. And, and, uh, and yet, with the help of my uh, opposition critics, both went out uh, into the communities and we sold traceability. And now, thank the good Lord that we have, because we wouldn't be able to export the amount of beef that we do today. Interesting, yeah. Well, I guess it goes back to that saying, it, it, uh, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit for it. And being able to share the, the credit and the responsibility and the effort of, of creating legislation. Yeah. Is, it's all about the people and it's what's good for the general public, yeah. not for the person. Jim, your, your whole family are known for, for leadership. Your mother plays such a wonderful role as chancellor of the university. And somebody asked me if I'd met your mother and I said, uh, uh, well, no, sorry, no, was she a chancellor? Was she? Sorry. Was your, your mother was chancellor. Chancellor, yeah. 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 Uh, I once stayed in a hotel room in the Hotel McDonald that was devoted to your mother, so I felt like I'd met her because I read about <laughs> her. But when you were growing up, I mean, you, you, all of your family, and the role that you've played here uh, uh, on the board and on, on the Senate and uh, things, what's your sense about, about, about leadership? What are the things that you've learned that have enabled you to help move things forward in areas that you cared about? Well, I'd, I'd say it's uh, really a matter of you've got a vision, then you have to rally the troops to, to go along with that vision. That's really what leadership's all about, mm -hmm. if you can do that. I mean, the thing is, you look at your own skill set. I don't have, I, I look, you know, I grew up on the farm, you would work on the tractor and you'd go and you'd plow the field and you'd do some books and things like that. And as, as the company grows and you're, uh, you're starting to uh, get you know, a bigger company, you, you realize your skill set isn't that great. And so you gotta focus in on the things you can do well then rally the other people to ensure they're on board with you and then draw on their skills because you simply don't have them. Mm -hmm. And so I think leadership is really looking at that person and that person and saying, wow, those are the, the be great assets for our company. How do we take those people and ensure that they have the same passion, share the passion that you have for the business? If you can do that, that's leadership. Mm -hmm. Because again, as a leader, you really don't have a lot of real skill. You just have a, a, an ability, hopefully, to take this group of talented people and move them along and have them share your vision. And one thing you don't, it's not about consensus because you're gonna have people that love you from day one, people that are on the fence, you're gonna try and convince them, and these people just don't like you. And hopefully the people that don't like you don't get in the way, and they, if they don't like you that much, maybe they can appreciate at least your vision and uh, help facilitate it. But, and you know, that, that, to me, that's what the leadership's about. Well, it's interesting because the Globe and Mail had an article a few weeks ago. The headline said, why are managers so clueless as leaders? And it's really sort of what you're talking about, that very often the skills that you have that enable you to accomplish one thing aren't necessarily what you need to be able to, to, uh, to lead a process. And, and what you're talking about is learning actually by observing and bringing people that you think have the skills that can move a process forward. Yeah, I remember, I just I remember uh, Chip Wilson from Lululemon speaking with the, uh, and the business faculty 
talking about, and it's, it stuck with me. He said, you've got to, as you move up, you've got to be, you've got to go narrow and deep. So you, you realize you've got that skill set, so focus in on that. Really try to do the best you can within that narrow framework because you can't do all the other things because you're just not good enough at it. Jana, what do you think, uh, in, in observing the, the changes of policy, for example, that you've been involved in, your colleagues have been involved in helping to support, what do you think has made for success in changing some of those policies? Have you uh, had a chance to observe those processes in a way? Uh, yeah, we've been up close and personal in some of those processes. And, and I think um, one of the things that I think has, has given us an opportunity to have some influence is working with the people who are going to be making the decisions right from the very beginning, engaging them in the research process, um, making sure that they have input into the, even the research questions that we're asking. We need to know what they need to know in order to be able to answer their questions. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to involve them right from the very beginning. And I agree with, with, with Jim that a lot of this is not about management, it's about being able to um, surround yourself with the right people to um, be able to to understand what they're bringing to the table, what their expertise is, um, and making sure that they have an opportunity to um, apply that expertise um, rather than asking them to do something that they're not very good at or that they're not particularly interested in. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of, of pointing people in the right direction and getting out of the way. Um, but I think those, those people management skills, I think, uh, not management, the, the people leadership skills, I think are some of the most important. Um, I've, had, I've worked with some, some really good leaders and I've worked with some very poor leaders and I try, I try to um, be the kind of leader, of the, the, the type of leader that was represented by the kind of person I wanted to follow as opposed to the, to the leader that I wanted to run away from. <laughs> so. Bill, you, you lead the Elmvale uh, Festival, Water Festival, and uh, involving community groups. What do you, how do you get people excited about what you think is important? What do you think are some of the best ways to mobilize people in the issues that, that matter most to you? Um, I, I don't know if I can really answer that. I don't know uh, how successful we've, we've really been. Um, I wish I had more time for the foundation and the, and the festival. I wasn't at the festival this year. I was on the Athabasca River doing some water sampling. Um, you asked about clean water. Uh, I think we'll find some clean water in Alberta and some surprising places. Um, what I want to say is I, I think you have to really identify some real questions and some real concerns that people have. And um, you have to be able to explain to people uh, in a way that they can understand. And uh, the real purpose of the water festival, so the first festival in human history where you can drink all you want for free all day, <laughs> okay? And we gave away for free a reusable, non-toxic, dishwasher-safe water bottle to educate people how easy it is to fill up your own water bottle, reduce your carbon footprint, and so on. But we had hands-on um, education for children and uh, films and speakers and so on, which reached out to the community. And uh, the amazing thing is when people really understand how clean their water is and how valuable their water is, they're very motivated to protect it for future generations. So um, I guess education is very empowering because if you educate people, you've given them something that nobody can ever take away from them under any circumstances. Well, these are all very interesting observations and lessons on leadership. And uh, I'm looking forward in the Lahey College to be continuing these conversations and particularly to make use of the wonderful minds and the people who have uh, not just been involved with AILS, but also in the issues uh, as, as policymakers uh, that have been so important. So I want to say, on, uh, say thank you to all of our panelists for our conversation this afternoon. And, uh, and to all of you, I want to congratulate all of you who are graduates of this wonderful faculty and all of you who are committed to its future because it really is where so many of the issues that will 
uh, affect our quality of life and our survivability will be wrestled with. So from the Green Revolution to pure water to really knowing what's, what's what in, in our moss to, to supporting sensible and intelligent policies as we change demographically to be good policymakers and good business leaders. Uh, it's all part of making a great society. So thank you very much. Happy birthday, Ailes.